Oh, come in. Oh, come in, come in. I'm just, uh, fact, go past me there. I was just reaching up for a, a volume of Milton. This is one of three, isn't it beautifully bound? A really <coughs> lovely marble paper. It's um, the third of an old done edition of the British Poets. This is the work, Poetical Works of John Milton, volume three, London, William Pickering, 1832. So uh, that's, um, gosh, it's coming up for 200 years old, isn't it? Another 10 years. Um, I was reaching for this volume um, because, um, well, you know, how I think I told you once that um, Seamus Heaney once said to me that uh, what poetry offers is phrases that feed the soul. And if you're fortunate enough to have some scraps of poetry, shall we say, uh, festooned about your heart somewhere. What often happens is that a phrase from a poem you've known and loved suddenly rises to your mind in a quite different context. And so it proved to be with a poem um, of Milton's, a very famous, or perhaps I should say once very famous poem called Lycidas. It's printed among his minor poems, but only minor in the sense that it's not Paradise Lost. It's an elegy. It's modelled on classical elegy, where everything is done as though people were shepherds and nymphs and so on. But it's a really heartfelt elegy for the death of his friend Edward King. They were at Cambridge together. Um, when I first read it, I mean, I'd heard my mother recite it, but uh, when I read it at Cambridge, I got to the bit where they're young men at Cambridge together, although it's all disguised in shepherd language. I had this amazing thrill because I thought, gosh, you know, I'm a young man in Cambridge and I've got friends. And it's about being two young friends in Cambridge wanting to be poets and one of them dying. And his friend dies and Milton has a bit in the middle. He says, why do I bother? Why am I going on? What's it for? Um, you know, and uh, it's just an astonishing thing when you're a young man at Cambridge. You think, gosh, Milton was here and... and then you love Coleridge, and Coleridge is here, and George Herbert, and George Herbert was here at Tennyson, you know. You feel this thread of connection. But uh, there's various points where I've connected with this poem more viscerally. Um, obviously, any time you're lamenting somebody, because it's a great poem of lament. Um, but when Milton asks the question, what's the point? Alas, what boots it with incessant care to tend the homely, plighted shepherd's trade, you know. Um, strictly uh, to, to scorn delights and live laborious days and strictly meditate the thankless muse. And he says, you know, comes the blind fury with the abhorrent shears and slits the thin-spun life. But not the fame, Phoebus replies. And this was the bit that came to me. It so happens that um, just recently, just through a concatenation of events, my name has been more often mentioned than it has been and there was this article in Christianity Today and somebody in some tweet or message to me said ah your star is rising and that just gave me a slight momentary pause partly because any star that rises must also decline but partly because Milton uses the image of a star and fame in a very different way from the world does it's a bit in this poem where he says, you know, he says, when when we think to burst out in a sudden blaze, comes the blind fury with the abhorred shears and slits the thin-spun life, but not the fame, Phoebus replies. But then he says, fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil or in the glistering foil set off to the world. As he, the Lord, pronounces lastly on each deed. Of so much fame in heaven, expect thy mead. And it's kind of word from Milton to himself, who was actually desperate to be a famous poet. But you know, it's, it's going like, no, fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil. And that came back to me, and uh, I thought, gosh, I should reread Lycidas. So as you pop by, I thought I'd reread it with you. I hope we've got time. It's, it's just a, a beautiful poem. Um, 
Uh, let's let's give it a go. Listen us. Yet once more, O oh ye laurels, and once more ye myrtles brown with ivy never sear, I come to pluck your berries harsh and crude, and with forced fingers rude shatter your leaves before the mellowing year. Bitter constraint and sad occasion, dear, compel me to disturb your season due, for Lycidas is dead, dead ere his prime, young Lycidas, and hath not left his peer. Who would not sing for Lycidas? He knew himself to sing and build the lofty rhyme. He must not float upon his watery beer unwept and welter to the parching wind without the meed of some melodious tear. Begin then, sisters of the sacred well that from beneath the seat of Job doth spring, begin and somewhat loudly sweep the string. Hence, with denial vain and coy excuse, so may... Some gentle muse with lucky words favour my destined urn, and as he passes, turn and bid fair peace be to my sable shroud. For we were nursed upon the self same hill, fed the same flock by fountain, shade and rill, together both, ere the high lawns appeared under the opening eyelids of the morn, we drove a field. And both together heard what time the grey fly winds his sultry horn, battening our flocks with the fresh dews of night. Oft till the star that rose at evening light toward the heaven's descent had sloped his westering wheel. Meanwhile, our rural ditties were not mute. Tempered to the oaten flute, rough satyrs danced, and fawns with cloven heel from the glad sound would not be absent long, and old Demetus loved to hear our song. But, oh, the heavy change, now thou art gone, now thou art gone and never must return. Thee, shepherd, thee, the woods and desert caves, with wild thyme and the gadding vine o'ergrown, and all their echoes mourn, the willows and the hazel copses green shall now no more be seen, fanning their joyous leaves to thy soft lays, as killing as the canker to the rose, or taint-worm to the weanling herds that graze, or frost to flowers that their gay wardrobe wear when first the white thorn blows. Such licit us thy loss to shepherd's ear. Where were ye, nymphs, when the remorseless deep closed o'er the head of your loved licit us? For neither were ye playing on the steep where your old bards, the famous druids, lie, nor on the shaggy top of Mona High, nor yet where Diva spreads her wizard stream. I me, I fondly dream. Had ye been there, for what could you that have done? What could the muse herself that Orpheus bore, the muse for her enchanting son, whom universal nature did lament, when by the rout that made the hideous roar his gory visage down the stream was sent, down to swift Hebrus and the lesbian shore? Alas, what boots it, with incessant care, to tend the homely plighted shepherd's trade and strictly meditate the thankless muse. Were it not better done, as others use, to sport with Amaryllis in the shade or in the tangles of Nyera's hair? Fame is the spur that the clear spirit doth raise, <laughs> the last infirmity of noble mind to scorn delights and live laborious days. But the fair guerdon, when we hope to find and think to burst out into sudden blaze, comes the blind fury with the abhorred shears and slits the thin-spun life. But not the praise, Phoebus replies, and touched my trembling ears. Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, nor into the, in the glistering foil set off to the world, nor in broad rumour lies, but lives and spreads aloft by those pure eyes and perfect witness of all judging Jove, as he pronounces lastly on each deed, 
of so much fame in heaven expect thy meed. O fountain Arethus, and thou honoured floods for smooth sliding Mincius crowned with vocal reeds, that strain I heard was of a higher sound. But now my oat proceeds and listens to the heralds of the sea that came in Neptune's plea. He asked the waves and asked the felon winds what hard mishap hath doomed this gentle swain and questioned every gust of rugged wings that blows from off each beakered promontory. They knew not of his story. And sage Hippotades their answer brings that not a blast was from his dungeon strayed. The air was calm and on the level brim brine sleek panoply and all her sisters played. It was that fatal and perfidious bark built in the eclipse and rigged with curses dark that sunk so low that sacred head of thine. Next, Camus, reverend sire, went footing slow, his mantle hairy and his bonnet sedge, inwrought with figures dim, and on the edge like to that sanguine flower inscribed with woe. Ah, who have reft, quoth he, my dearest pledge, last came and last did go, the pilot of the Galilean lake. St. Peter, two massy keys he bore of metals twain, the golden opes, the iron shuts amain. He shook his mitred locks and stern bespake. How well could I have spared for thee, young swain, in now of such as for their belly's sake creep and intrude and climb into the fold. Of other care they little reckoning make than how to scramble at the shearer's feast and shove away the worthy bidden guest. Blind mouths that scarce themselves know how to hold a sheep hook, or have learned aught else the least that to a faithful herdsman's art belongs. What wrecks it them? What need they? They are spared. And when they list, their lean and flashy songs grate on their scrannel pipes of wretched straw. The hungry sheep look up and are not fed. But swollen with wind and the rank mist they draw rot inwardly and foul contagion spread. Besides what the grim wolf with privy poor daily devours apace and nothing said. But... <laughs> That two-handed engine at the door stands ready to smite once and smite no more. Return, Alpheus, the dread voices past that shrunk thy streams. Return, Sicilian muse, and call the veils and bid them hither cast their bells and flowerets of a thousand hues. Ye valleys low where the mild whispers use of shades and wanton winds and gushing brooks on whose fresh la lap the swart star sparely looks, throw hither all your quaint enamelled dyes that on the green turf suck the honeyed showers and purple all the ground with vernal flowers. Bring the wraith primrose that forsaken dyes, the tufted croto and pale jessamine, the white pink and the pansy freaked with jet, the glowing violet, the musk rose and the well-attired woodbine with cowslips one that hang the pensive head and every flower that sad embroidery wears bid amaranthus all his beauty shed and daffodillies fill their cups with tears to strew the laureate hearse where licit lies <laughs> for so to interpose a little ease let our frail thoughts dally with false surmise, I me, whilst thee the shores and sounding seas wash far away, whether thy bones are hurled beyond the stormy Hebrides, or thou perhaps under the whelming tide visits the bottom of the monstrous world, or whether thou to our moist vows denied sleeps by the fable of Bellerus old, where the great vision of the guarded mount looks towards Namancos and Bionis old. Look homeward, angel now, and melt with Ruth, and O ye dolphins, waft the hapless youth. Weep no more, woeful shepherds, weep no more, 
Felicitas, your sorrow is not dead. Sunk though he be beneath the watery floor, so sinks the day star in the ocean bed, and yet anon repairs his drooping head, and tricks his beams, and with new spangled ore flames in the forehead of the morning sky. So Lycidas, sunk low, but mounted high, through the dear might of him that walked the waves, where other groves and other streams along with nectar pure his oozy locks he laves, and hears the unexpressive nuptial song in the blessed kingdom meek of joy and love. There entertain him all the saints above in solemn troops and sweet societies that sing and singing in their glory move and wipe the tears for ever from his eyes. Now, Lycidas, the shepherds weep no more, Henceforth thou art the genius of the shore, in thy large recompense, and shalt be good to all who wander in that perilous flood. Thus sang the uncouth swain to the oaks and rills, while still the morn went out with sandals grey. He touched the tender stops of various quills, with eager thought warbling his Doric lay. And now the sun had stretched out all the hills, and now was dropped into the western bay. At last he rose and twitched his mantle blue, tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. It's lunch up.